Number 27, write the formulas of the following compounds. Okay, we're like almost halfway done with the nomenclature. So if you need more practice, you could always see the questions beforehand. And there's tons more questions afterwards. If you guys just need more practice, just so that I can state that now. And now let's get into it. So remember, for any time that you need to write a compound, right, or write the formula, you always need to know whether it's either going to be an ionic compound or covalent. Remember that ionic is always a metal plus a nonmetal. So if you definitely see a metal, right, it will always be ionic. Covalent are more than one nonmetal. There are some exceptions to the rule. And if I do come with those exceptions, I will let you know here. All right, so let's get started. We have A, chlorine dioxide. Okay, so chlorine is over here. That's a nonmetal. And dioxide, oxide is oxygen, right? So that's over here. So these are both nonmetals. So this would be covalent. Now, covalent compounds, I always like to call it the call it as you see it method. We will be using prefixes, and you only use prefixes for covalent compounds. You will never use prefixes for ionic compounds. So I also see right off the bat that I see a dye in here. So that also signifies that this is covalent. So there's many different ways to tell you what way your name in your compounds. So call it as you see it. They tell me that I just have chlorine here. Now, they don't tell me whether it's di or tri or tetra, penta. They just say chlorine, which signifies that there's only one chlorine in the compound. So I could just write Cl. Here, they tell me that I have dioxide. Di means two, right? So this guy means two. So that means that I have two oxygens. So this would be ClO2. As easy as that. So this would just be ClO2, and A is done. B, dinitrogen tetraoxide. Okay, so you could do it both ways. You could see that nitrogen is over here, oxygen's over here. They're both covalent. Well, they're, they're both nonmetals, so it would be a covalent compound. Or if you see your prefixes, di and tetra, this is also um, information to tell you that it's a covalent compound. And with covalent compounds, it's call it as you see it. So now in this case, they're telling me that I have di nitrogen, right? So di means two. So this would be N2, because nitrogen is N. And now they're telling you tetra oxide. So how many oxygens? Tetra is four. So it would be N2O4. Now, question is though, do you simplify these? I see that I have a two and a four. So maybe I can divide this by two, divide this by two to get a simpler number like we do in ionic compounds. The answer is no. For ionic compounds, you will simplify. But for covalent compounds, you will never, ever, ever simplify. So don't be tempted. Whatever they give you here, that's what it is. So this would be N2O4. And that's the answer for B. C, potassium phosphide. Okay, well, where's potassium? Potassium is over here. It's K. That's a metal. So I automatically know that it's ionic. Now, for ionic, remember, we use the crisscross method. What does that mean, though? We have to use the oxidation states, which means that you should know your oxidation state trend. And we went over this already before in the last section. Group one is always a plus one. Group two is a plus two. There is no trend for your transitions, so we skip over them. Then this becomes a plus three. Now we start turning over. So this would be a plus or a minus four. This would be a minus three, minus two, minus one, and then zero. So since potassium is in group one, and group one is always a plus one charge, potassium 
is K plus 1. Phosphide comes from phosphorus. Remember, chances are if you see an IDE ending, that means that it's going to come from the periodic table. There is an exception, hydroxide, which is a polyatomic, but phosphide, this is just phosphorus. So that's a P, and phosphorus is over here. It's a negative 3 charge. So now you can do your crisscross method. So this plus 1 tells me that I only need 1 phosphorus. This minus 3 tells me that I only need 3 potassium, right? And just, just look that I don't put like plus 1 and I don't put minus 3. I just put the 3 and the 1 here. Because when you do that, it's kind of like a trick. These numbers will vanish. And then these are your new subscripts. And when you see that you have one of something, that's automatically the empirical formula. So you don't have to simplify. So this would be K3P. That's it. So potassium phosphide, K3P, and you're done with that. Moving on. So now I can erase this. And let me just erase it a little bit at the bottom here to get to the last three. So we have D. Silver. 1, sulfide. Okay. Silver. Where is silver? Silver is right here. It's Ag on the periodic table. This is a metal, so it's a ionic compound. So we would still use the crisscross method from the oxidation states. However, if I look up top here, uh, what? There's no trend for my transition metals, right? So how am I going to know what oxidation state silver is. Enter the Roman numeral. The Roman numeral is always the oxidation state of the metal. That's why it's there. So it's always going to be the oxidation state, the charge of the metal. So by this being a one, this is telling me that silver AG was a plus one charge. And it's plus because it's in the front. Silver was named first and generally all the pluses are in the front. And also metals like to be positive. So that's how I know that it's a positive and not a negative. And now we have sulfide. Sulfide comes from sulfur. Sulfur is over here. It's a negative two. So it would be a S minus two. And that's another reason why you know that this has to be a plus one because you can never have two negatives or two positives in a single compound. But now since you have the charges, you can crisscross them. This one from AG tells me that I need one sulfur. This two from sulfur tells me that I need two AGs. So it would be AG2S. I don't have to write the one because anything that doesn't state the number is assumed that it's one. So this would just be AG2S. And that's it. E. Aluminum fluoride trihydrate. Okay. Well, I see that I have a normal compound here, but then just attached with a trihydrate. So Let's work with trying to figure out what this compound would be, and then we could just tackle on the trihydrate at the end. So aluminum fluoride. Aluminum is over here. This is a metal, so it has to be ionic. So that means I have to crisscross, which means I need to know the charges. So aluminum is Al with a plus 3, because aluminum is in the plus 3 charge. Fluoride comes from fluorine, and fluorine's over here. It's a negative one. So I have F minus 1. Now I have my charges, so I can crisscross them. So this 3 tells me that I need 3 fluorines. This 1 will tell me that I need 1 aluminum. There's 1 in my compound, which means that it's in the simplest form. So this is just AlF3. That checks out this part. Now we just have to worry about the trihydrate. Well, tri, we've seen this word before. It's over here. Three means tri, right? So when I have a hydrate compound, 
That just is a fancy way of saying this has water. Hydrate, right? We hydrate ourselves. We have to drink water. So a hydrate is water. Now, when we do have a hydrate compound, you always put this little dot symbol here to represent that it will be a hydrate. It does not means it does not mean times. It just means that you have a hydrate. But how many waters do you have? Try three hydrates. So it would just be that symbol, 3H2O. And it's simple as that. So aluminum fluoride trihydrate would be ALF3 dot 3H2O. Remember, the dot just signifies that you have a hydrate. It's not that you're multiplying these two or anything like that. All right? And then last but not least, let's just get rid of some of this. And let's just finish it out. Let's see if I could just get rid of a little bit of this. Okay, that's good enough. Last but not least, we have F, which is silicon dioxide. Okay, so silicon is over here. Oh, that's a metalloid. Hmm. Well, I'm just going to write SI for now, right? I don't know whether it's going to be covalent or ionic, because remember, metalloids have both metal and non-metal properties. But maybe the dioxide will give you a hint. If I'm using the prefix di, prefixes are only used for covalent compounds. So this overall has to be covalent. So it actually follows the covalent compound rules. We do not have to crisscross here. So silicon, just saying silicon, right, means that I only have one silicon. They didn't tell me tetrasilicon or pentasilicon, so it's just one. And then dioxide, oxide is oxygen. Di means that there's two. So it's just SiO2. And that one was this one. And that checks this, this question off. What do you think, guys? I think this is pretty good. Hopefully with more practice and all the problems, you guys will be perfect at this. I know you can do it. You guys got this, all right? I'll always be here for you guys in all the questions. So we could always learn from each other, right? And work, work together. So thank you so much. Click the subscribe button if this helped. And if you want all the answers in your feed, that'll be pretty cool for, you know, tests and quizzes and stuff like that. And yeah, if this helped you at all, click the like button or smash the like button as they say. Thank you so much. I'll see you guys in the next question. Bye-bye.